Welcome to the fascinating underwater world of submarine operations. Today we're going to explore the aspects of anti-submarine warfare, or ASW. ASW is the practice of detecting, tracking, and localizing submarines and denying their operations in specific regions and areas that you determine. It's often been described as playing chess at depth, with low observability, only using electronic sensors and employing stealth and deception to gain an advantage. This is ASW. Submarines asserted themselves as a threat really in World War I. And this is important. This was not the first time submarines were used in war, but this is the first use at scale that could shift the balance of naval power. U-boats uh, from the German high seas fleet scored major victories against the Royal Navy early on in World War I. U-21 famously sunk HMS Pathfinder with a torpedo that detonated the ship's magazine on September 5, 1914. The ship sank in about four minutes, taking 259 Royal Navy sailors to the bottom. Just two weeks later, U-9 spotted three Royal Navy armored cruisers and systematically sunk each one with torpedoes in about an hour, killing over 1,400 Royal Navy sailors. Submarines have an inherent advantage, and it's stealth. Naval ambush is a devastating tactic because in naval warfare, he who fires first often wins. Submarines can choose the time and place of the attack. Over a hundred years later, navies around the world have designated anti-submarine warfare teams and doctrine to mitigate the impact submarines can have on fleet operations. Submarines are stealthy predators that can disrupt trade routes, strike land targets hundreds of miles inland, and destroy entire fleets if left unchecked. ASW is vital to maritime dominance. Anti-submarine warfare centers around sonar. Now, sonar is an acronym meaning sound, navigation, and ranging sonar. Because submarines are submerged in water, sound becomes the primary method of detecting them rather than radar or light visually. Sonar systems are used by aircraft, ships, unmanned drones, and other submarines to find each other. So let's take a look at anti-submarine warfare from a submarine's perspective. Sound is the primary method of detection, as I've said, and that is why submarines have different modes of operations. I'm going to talk about two of them, and there are many more in reality, and I'm also not going to use their real names. Let's call it normal operations, and then we'll call the other one silent operations. And the reality of sailing a submarine underwater for weeks and months at a time is that you have to conduct operations and evolutions that will make noise. You're not always going to be as silent as you want to be if you want to keep that submarine functional and safe to operate while submerged. So there are going to be times when you do noisy things, and we'll call those normal operations. As a submarine captain, you have to plan as when and where you do these normal noisy evolutions. And then make a distinct shift to be quiet or go into a silent running mode for as long as you can. And that distinction between noisy evolutions and silent operations is just one key factor in keeping yourself from being detected. Because when you're doing normal noisy evolutions, you are much more vulnerable. Now, an important part of submarine operation is knowing your environment. The water column you operate in doesn't stay static. It's very dynamic and contains many advantages submarines can use. For example, seasonal and daily temperature changes create layers of warm and cold water over each other. These changes in temperature affect the density of water and that density bends sound in different ways depending on the density change. So submarines, because they operate in this environment naturally, can use these features to hide submarine noise and they do. Knowing how to do that is very important. Uh, one tactic that is very common in modern naval warfare is bottom terrain, using bottom terrain to mask, literally shadow, own ship noise from adversary arrays, whether that's a sonar buoy or a, a surface ship. Using the terrain to literally hide your submarine is uh, a very effective tactic. Placing certain bottom features between you and your potential threat is uh, very important. 
one great example of how a submarine used its environment to hide itself, in this case, the temperature and density changes and layers, was the 1982 Falkland Island War when warship Belgrano was struck with two out of three torpedoes shot by HMS Conqueror. And despite this ship having an ASW destroyer escort that never saw HMS Conqueror, she was sunk in a single day. Now, before we go on, I wanna thank you for watching this far. Subscribers who watch my videos and digest the information I'm putting out on YouTube for free are among the most educated naval operations people and naval warfare people out there, and that's you. So share your knowledge, impress your friends if you want to, but let them know about the Subbrief YouTube channel and join our Patreon. We have a free tier, we have a $1 tier that gets you all everything, and we're adding new content there all the time. A lot of the content that I'm adding now never makes it onto YouTube. I'm talking photos, uh, technical documents, and Q&A sessions that I share just with the Patreons. It's worth your time. All right, so how can a fleet defend against submarines that have such an advantage? Well, the big thing you wanna take from this is anti-submarine warfare is a team sport. Everyone will have a piece of the tactical picture and it's up to the operational watchstanders, whether that's the sonar team, or the tactical operations officer uh, to put all these little pieces together and hem in the fence, if you will, around the submarine detection or the submerged detection. A great example of this is this regional perspective I'm gonna give you uh, outside China. China built what we call in the United States here, and this is not like an official name or anything, but the Great Underwater Wall. Uh, it is a network of listening posts that are often powered by shore facilities, but not always, to collect acoustic data. They have all these arrays uh, in the South China Sea and in the Pacific as well. And they're analyzing this information in real time using sonar teams ashore. Any noise that falls within its cone of detection will be detected. Whether or not it's recognized is another matter entirely, but it will be detected. The limitation of the localization of the target submarines um, is that it's not precise. They just know they have a detection and they're going to have an area of uncertainty that grows every minute after the detection is made. Um, but they just know that someone's out there. They can't really pinpoint it without additional assets in the area. Now, China does uh, call this good wind ears, uh, or if you translate it more literally, it's all knowing ears. That's kind of the Chinese uh, official name for this underwater Great Wall. I kind of like our name better. Here's some photos of that Great Wall while it was being constructed. This comes from H.I. Sutton's website, a uh, friend of the channel, great guy, look him up, follow him on Twitter. Uh, these are the junction boxes that connect those underwater hydrophones here. And here you can see uh, they're connected via these fiber optic cables. Uh, this is them being set on the bottom and then being connected. Uh, each one of these arrays are digitally beamformed. So as they add more and more hydrophones to it, they can do more and more with the array itself, uh, including changing the frequency range of it, uh, the, the whole gamut. It's all, it's, it's quite interesting how they did this. Uh, this is them actually deploying those arrays. This gives you an idea of how deep they are because that is the cable going from the surface down to the bottom uh, to connect everything together, to begin connecting everything together. Yeah. So once deployed, ROVs are sent to the bottom to connect them. As you see here, that's the arm of a remote operated vehicle connecting power and uh, fiber optics to it. This is a model showing how the ROV right above my head here can autonomously dock and charge itself while submerged. Doesn't need to transit from the surface down to the bottom. It just stays on the bottom in its little station here. And it can conduct routine maintenance uh, whenever it's, if there's a problem with the array or they want to inspect something, they simply can send a command from the shore facilities that's getting all the acoustic data anyway, and send out the ROV within minutes to inspect and conduct maintenance on the array. All of this is already in place and has been in place, frankly, for years. So China is taking advantage of bottom topography to funnel sound towards these underwater sensors. It is clear to me, looking at where they place these, that China understands physics. They understand how sound propagates underwater, and they're taking advantage of the topography by placing arrays in funnels, essentially, where sound is going to be concentrated, increasing the likelihood of a detection. 
they're very they're being very smart, very wise with uh, with this system. So once they get a detection and they have this large area of uncertainty that could be a submarine, they're not sure. The next step would be to employ other assets. The most one of the most agile assets out there is naval air power. Any kind of marine uh, or maritime patrol aircraft are designated primarily for this mission among others. This is the Chinese uh, KQ-200, also called the Y-8, maritime patrol aircraft. It's designated as an anti-submarine warfare platform. It can fly for up to 10 hours at a time. It employs multiple sensor technologies like uh, a magnetic detection boom that sticks out the aft end of the plane that you can see there. Uh, they carry hundreds of hydrophones called sonar buoys uh, of the SQ-4 and SQ-5 variety, and even have surface search and electro-optical sensors to simply look out there for any submarines that are shallow, periscope depth, or even on the surface. Because remember, many submarines, especially in this region of the world, South China Sea region, are conventionally powered. They have to come shallow regularly to recharge their energy cells or batteries, whatever they have. And that's when they'll employ uh, sensors like that electrical optical sensor to find them there. So the white does have ASW weapons, but their primary role is to localize and maintain track on that detection. They wanna begin hemming in an area of uncertainty, shrinking that like a fence around the target. Now, eventually, and this can take days, uh, the ASW detachment or flotilla will arrive in area with the airplanes overhead. Uh, the air assets will be sharing uh, data with the surface assets. Uh, the air assets will act as submarine wranglers. Uh, imagine them like sheepdogs going around the outside of the herd with the surface ships running into the herd looking to bisect and shrink the area of uncertainty, shrink that fence they have around the sound detection that they got sometimes days ago. What these units are going to do is employ active sonar. And this is a fantastic tool at taking away one of the submarine's major advantages, and that is its quietness. Uh, because submarines are designed to not make a lot of noise, they're very hard to hear. But whenever you insonify entire areas of the ocean with loud, active pulses, you're negating that sound advantage because you're insonifying the submarine itself, the submarine hull itself, with you know, hundreds of decibels of energy that is then reflected back at you. No matter how quiet or loud the submarine is itself, it doesn't matter anymore because you've hit it with a basically a wall of sound that is then being reflected back to the ship sensors or sonar buoys to get a, uh, a detection on that. So these flotillas will come in and perform active sonar searches to try and localize and further shrink that area of uncertainty around the submarine. The submarine's presence in this case is its vulnerability. No matter how quiet it is, it no longer matters. If it's there and it's hit with 240 decibels of sound, it's going to re make a return. This is why anti-submarine warfare is a team sport. Forces ashore, airborne, and seaborne are all working together for days and sometimes weeks prosecuting a submarine, a single submarine. Any failure or mistake by anyone in this coordinated effort can result in the submarine escaping or worse. Because during wartime, the submarine will be punching back. They'll be counterattacking. In this case, in this example that I'm giving you, this is a group of people using ships and planes to uh, prosecute a submarine that can see them coming. That submarine is going to sink a lot of the ships coming after it, even if it's just trying to evade, because it's awfully hard to do an active sonar search when you're busy picking up sailors out of the water from the neighboring ship that just got blown to kingdom come by an ADCAP torpedo. Ladies and gentlemen, I know these things because I did them for decades in the U.S. Navy. Anti-submarine warfare is complex. It requires coordination and communication among many assets. And despite everyone performing their best, the submarine may still escape due to its inherent advantages. Uh, when you do everything right, the submarine uh, may still get away, and that's okay because remember, the purpose of anti-submarine warfare is not to sink the submarine. It is to deny submarine operations in a specific area that you determine. If you can do that 
and sink the submarine, that's great, but you don't have to sink it to achieve a successful ASW operation. Planning and executing a sonar search plan is one of the most rewarding things I ever did in the Navy. And if you enjoy hunting, hunting for clues, investigating detections, and chasing someone who is trained in evasion, well, if that interests you, congratulations. You're a sonarman. If you want more detailed Chinese warship reviews from a submarine sonar perspective, check out this Type 053H3 video right here.